Rabban wa Ahlan Bakum fi Baranamij Dachel Washington. Ma'akum Mudifakum Robert Satloff. Adala Mutosawia Amamel Kanun. Hadahi el Ibara Mahfura ala Wajahat Mabna el Mahkamat al Uliya fi Washington. Wa hiya el Ma'ana el Akthar Ahamiyat fi el Mushkilat al Kanunia. Eleti Tawajuh Reis Sabak Donald Trump, while Hunter Biden, Najil Reis El Hali. Benispe il Trump, Acher El Akbar, Kenneth Idafat Tuhum Jadida, Il Al Kadia El Mutaalaka Bewithaik Sariya, Yuzam An Reis Sabak, Echtafad, Biha, Bad Muhadaratihi El Beit Labiat. Hadahi Mujarad Wahida min Adat Halad Yuajaha Kabla Budat Ashur Chasar El Reis Kadiat Itida Junsi Wa Tashir Wahua Yuajah La Ihat Itahem Fi New York Tata Alek Be Itahakat Tamwil El Hamalat El Intahabia Aber Dafa Amwel La Amrat Bisabab alaka junsia. Thum hunak halatan akhariyan. Le el ula el ta'amur le harman Joe Biden min al faus fil le dhabat. Wal thania an daurihi fi hujum el sadis min yunayer ala mabna el capital. Kul hadahi el umur tachduth bainama yahud Trump. Hamlatihi le Torashuk lil Riasa Anil Hizb El Jumhuri. Fil Wak Nafsihi, you ani hunter, Najalara Isil Hali, min Mushkalat Kanunia, Khatira, Budan min el Taharub el Daribi, Wasulan illa hiazat el Salah, Wakad Bada el Adid min al Jumhuriin. Feel to Saul an al Daur al Ladi Kama bihi wa alidihi fi ta amalat hunter el Tajaria el Ishkalia. Lumunakasha el Mushkalat al Kanunia el Ladi Tawajuk el Raisain el Hali wa Sabik, Yus Idni an Urahib, Bethalatha Sahafiin Siasiin Barzin, Todd Gilman, wa Sarah Ferris, wa David Hawkins. Welcome back to Dachel, Washington. This show is usually about politics, but this week we're becoming a crime show. That's because our politicians are up to their eyeballs in court cases. Let's start with our former president, Donald Trump. Recent news, of course, is the new federal indictment of Trump for trying to subvert the results of the 2020 presidential election. This is a blockbuster. David Hawkins, Sarah Ferris, Todd Gilman, thank you for helping to explain all this to our viewers. David, what's the story? Well, the story is that for the first time in American history, um, somebody has been indicted for federal crimes while being a sitting president. Uh, and not only, not just any crimes, but the unprecedented crime of essentially uh, using a, a, a web of lies, as the special prosecutor uh, said, to try and uh, overturn uh, a legitimate election that he lost. Uh, it doesn't get, it's, that's, it's, that's it in simple terms. Uh, we've expected, I think all the three of us have all been uh, expecting this for a while. We've sort of known the outlines of what this was going to be. Uh, but when you sit back and say those words, uh, it kind of makes your blood run cold. So, Sarah Ferris, um, uh, strange as it may be, it's not illegal to lie. Um, uh, I mean, politicians have been doing that since the beginning of time. What's at the actual crime that uh, Donald Trump is accused of committing? Well, in this particular case, um, it's subverting a, the the decision of voters. It's um, this uh, cons 
creating this conspiracy that then contributed to this violent attack on the Capitol. So uh, you're right, it's it's not illegal to lie. Politicians have been doing it for ages, but uh, the four counts at the center of this case are extremely serious, as, as David laid out. And it's all about, um, you know, this is the premise of American democracy is that voters will decide the outcome of the election and that the sitting president will not um, be using a variety of ways, be conspiracy with um be um, co coordinating with with several other people in his orbit to try to subvert that decision and to try to convince the American public. Um, three out of 10 voters, which now believe his lies, um, this is having a lasting effect. And that's that's what we saw um, when the special uh, counsel was was laying out these charges. So, Todd, let's just remind our viewers who is doing the accusing, what sort of court um, uh, uh, would would hear this case, um, uh, and um, what would be the theoretical penalties if Donald Trump were found guilty? Uh, well, let me start with the last question, and I, uh, it's not quite clear yet, at least to me, what the penalties possibly could be mm -hmm. legally, and part of that hinges on the politics of it, because if the uh, if the court proceedings take so long that the election takes place and Trump were to be elected president again in November and uh, under under the American court system, it's entirely plausible that a trial could take that long. Um, the penalty would be nothing because there's no way in the world in any universe where the Justice Department, which reports to the president of the United States, is going to try to drag that president into a federal prison. Um, so the, the court that is handling this is a, a, a federal district court in Washington, D.C., in the federal district. Um, it's a, a democratically appointed judge. Obviously, all judges, federal judges, are confirmed by the Senate, and they're supposed to not be partisan. But there are questions from Trump and his supporters about uh, the biases of this particular judge. And if the trial does take place in the District of Columbia... Uh, the overwhelming majority of voters in this area in the federal district are Democrats. And that's another part of at least the, the political pushback against this legal case against Trump is look how unfair this is that the Justice Department has brought this in a part of the country where Trump is very unlikely to get a very sympathetic jury. Uh, the prosecutor was named as a special counsel uh, there's a provision in law when there's any perception of uh, some kind of conflict of interest, political conflict of interest by the attorney general uh, to hand off a prosecution to someone who is independent and can make decisions without having to get permission from the attorney general. That's what Attorney General Merrick Garland did just after uh, Donald Trump announced he was running for re-election shortly after the the uh, the last election day he announced very very early and there's a lot of reason to believe he did that so that any prosecution that was probably going to come down the pike uh, would look political so uh, this is um a, a federal prosecution uh but separate from the department of justice because it is being handled by an allegedly independent prosecutor, a special counsel? Well, I, I wouldn't say separate from the Department of Justice. The special counsel has all of the resources of the federal Department of Justice, including the FBI, uh, but he doesn't report up through the normal chain of command that a federal prosecutor would report up through. And he's in many ways an independent actor to make decisions about what, what justice demands. So, um, uh, David, uh, uh, the president, uh, Donald Trump, was accused of a conspiracy to prevent Congress from counting and certifying a vote, um, uh, but he was the only one charged. There are six uncharged co-conspirators. Um, um, uh, you know, without getting into too much detail, who are these people and why were not they charged as well? The, the only name that many people in this audience may, may know uh, is Rudolph Giuliani, uh, famously the mayor of New York City uh, at the time of the September 11th attacks, went on and has now gone on to be the principal attorney for Donald Trump, the person. Not uh, And um, 
several other lawyers, half a dozen, a couple of political consultants, um, some Justice Department officials, actually. Um, all in all, this is the, the the team that Jack Smith describes that worked with Donald Trump to carry out this conspiracy. Um, why have they not been charged? Uh, I think that the answer to that is this keeps the pressure on that. that well, somebody might know this answer better than I, but as I understand it, an unindicted co-conspirator co -conspirator sort of has less uh, rights and privileges than a defendant, and that this keeps the pressure on them to cooperate uh, as the case goes forward, or else they will be charged. Ah, so it's a tactic to be used against the principal defendant, Donald Trump. I think that's right. I think this is, I think he's, you know, he is by far the biggest fish, and you, uh, you, these other, these other folks are now lined up to, to uh, help, help with the prosecution. All right. So, Sarah, how has President Trump responded? And perhaps just as important, how have all the other Republican presidential candidates and the Republican political universe responded to this blockbuster um, uh, indictment? So as he has done throughout his other two other um, indictments that he's faced this year, which is just unprecedented that that's where we're at, um, Donald Trump was the one who really broke the news that this was happening. He has been ahead of the story. This has been his strategy all along. Um, he announced that he was the subject of a so-called target letter um, several weeks ago, letting people know this was coming. Um, he has basically been the one to put the U.S. on the whole country on alert. This was happening. Um, so this means that his base is involved, his base is, is paying attention. Um, and he has been rec reciting a line that we've heard from even during his presidency, which is that um, the, the, his political adversaries are conspiring against him. He's been accusing the Biden administration of targeting him for political reasons. Of course, Trump is still the front runner and the Republican presidential primary. Joe Biden is running for re-election. So you have Biden's Justice Department um, lever uh, leveling these charges against his chief political rival. Trump knows that this is a situation that the American public um, is just beginning to understand that yet, as we've talked about, this is so unprecedented. So he's really taking advantage of the fact that a lot of people, uh, this is a new situation for people. And if he can convince his base, if he can convince maybe even some independent voters that the Biden administration is politically targeting him, he's been he's been saying, why are they charging me now? This These events happened two and a half years ago. They're choosing to do this now. Of course, that's, that's not true. The, these processes take a long time. Two and a half years is about what we'd expect for this. But Donald Trump is is trying to convince the American public that this is a political conspiracy against him. A lot of his rivals, um, this is a very awkward subject for them. They don't want to alienate the Republican base. The only candidate that I've seen really strongly come out against this is, is his former vice president, Mike Pence, who was at the center of this case as well, um, who had protesters chanting his name throughout the Capitol. Um, hang a Mike Pence. Um, he was someone who was extremely involved in this day. He's the only person who's called out Trump for his behavior that I've seen um, strongly on this. So this sets the tone for a very divisive next few months of the Republican presidential primary. Todd, I, I, I heard former President Trump actually uh, describe this as something akin to what would happen in Nazi Germany in the 1930s. Um, uh, are Republican voters are um, a Republican office holders around the country um, supporting that view of the uh, um, you know the operation of the Justice Department and the special counsel? I I have not heard anyone outside of Trump's immediate orbit um, invoke Nazi Germany or authoritarian dictatorships trying to uh, quash a, 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 a political opponent um, in that way. But they have largely echoed that line of argument that the Biden administration has politicized and weaponized the Justice Department uh, to try to weaken uh, the likely Republican nominee. Uh, there are a few more, apart from Vice President Pence, as, uh, as Sarah mentioned, there, there are some more uh, obscure Republicans running for president, and certainly uh, that, that smaller group of anti-Trump Republicans who say this is long overdue prosecution and it shows that he is unfit for office. Um, but it is it is a very delicate balance for many Republicans um, who are uncomfortable with the the deceit and the lengths to which Trump went to try to cling to power and to avoid the traditional 
peaceful transfer of power that we've seen throughout uh, American history, um, but are also uncomfortable with the idea that in the middle of a political campaign, that there might be a, a prosecution. It, it, is a, uh, it is a very sobering moment in American history. All right, with that, we're going to come back after a moment. We're going to talk about even some other um, uh, legal problems that former President Trump is, uh, is likely to face in just a moment here on Dachau, Washington. So, Sarah, Donald Trump has a lot more legal jeopardy than, than just this one huge case. It was just uh, um, several days ago that the same special counsel actually expanded indictments in another case. So what else is on Donald Trump's docket, both in the federal level and on the state level? Right. So um, Donald Trump is facing four different criminal investigations here. We now have three that have leveled charges against him. Uh, the one that we're still waiting on is another one related to the 2020 election. This one is taking place in Georgia. It has to do um, with his efforts to reverse the election loss there. Um, but the other three major ones, and, and again, these are all criminal cases. Um, the uh, We have the hush payments made to um, uh, made to his, his associate over uh, essentially a sex scandal. So that one is taking place in New York. That's a state trial uh, that will that will happen in the spring. I have to look at my notes because there's so many of these going on. Um, and then the really big one that, that Washington is paying a lot of attention to is the classified documents case. Uh, this again has the trial already set. This is going to happen um, in May of next year, right in the smack in the middle of the presidential election, um, right as Republicans are choosing their, their primary. Um, and we did just see three more charges leveled in that case, um, just just um, in late July. So this case is still expanding, um, and and this is a really really serious one. This is um, the president um, choosing to ignore longtime federal statutes on classified documents, and um, essentially um, not taking seriously his responsibility to. Um, and, and knowingly doing so to, to make sure that these documents are preserved and, and essentially having national secrets um, be exposed at, um, at his own will. So these, this is another really serious one. We're going to see two of those trials next year. So, Todd, th this is all on top of uh, Trump losing several months ago um, a case in New York, sexual abuse and defamation of a woman who claimed uh, she was raped by Donald Trump. We know the president, former president, is in remarkable legal jeopardy. What are the political implications of all this? Um, uh, I mean, he's going to be in and out of courtrooms nonstop for the next year. Potent potentially. And you know, we started this conversation um, noting that the, the most recent allegations have to do with conduct that, uh, that Trump did while he was president, the, the deceitful uh, efforts to overturn the election. Um, some of the cases that Sarah was just talking about, the, the most uh, jeopardy that he is in is that there is evidence now that he was trying to uh, destroy evidence that showed how he was trying to hide classified documents that were at his home in Florida. Uh, when federal authorities were demanding them because as a former president, he had no right to them. Um, this has sunk in very, very deeply with Democrats and with many independents um, and with, again, that sort of plurality of anti-Trump Republicans that has existed for years. But in the, the, the former president's own political base, they just don't buy it. They, they, they either think that it's not a big deal or they think it is fabricated against Trump. Well, regrettably, we have to cut this uh, discussion short. There is, uh, I'm, I'm sad as an American to say we have a lot to discuss when it comes to the legal troubles of our political leadership. Um, uh, uh, thank you, uh, David Hawkins, Sarah Ferris, and Todd Gilman for uh, helping to decipher all this for our viewers in the Middle East. Thank you for joining us on Dackel Washington. I just did something that I have never done before. I saw the middle of America. I have traveled all around the world from Guatemala to China, from Thailand to Cameroon, but I have never really seen middle America. You know, that's the part of the country we coastal elites 
referred to as flyover states, as in those states you fly over to get from the East Coast to the West Coast and back again. It is true in 1983, I did drive from Durham, North Carolina to Dallas, Texas, spending a night in glorious Hattiesburg, Mississippi. But that was a very long time ago. In the 40 years since, I don't think my non-coastal ventures ever took me outside of a three-block radius in Chicago and visits to my son's university in a lush and rarefied part of St. Louis. Until now. One of my sons is moving to Colorado for graduate school, so to help him get his car and stuff from the Washington suburbs where we live all the way to the Rocky Mountains, we agreed to drive together. What a terrific experience. 1,600 plus miles through Maryland, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Kansas, and Colorado. We didn't see everything in middle America, but we got a good, solid dose. Here are some observations. Americans are so darn friendly. Everywhere we went, we ran into people eager to talk, especially over hotel breakfast buffets, to say hello, to share travel experiences, and to just have a good time. I'm sure there are some unhappy people in America, but we didn't find them. Chicago is a fantastic city, full of life, so much more vibrant, modern, and accessible than I thought and remembered. It's called America's second city, but it seems so modern, so clean, so alive compared to the Big Apple, New York. But I have to be honest, I did not fall in love with its famous deep dish pizza, a pizza that's about three inches thick. I had to try it, but give me one of those giant Jersey boardwalk thin slices of za any day. I expected Kansas City, our second stop, to be a humdrum, middle of nowhere, boring, large farm town. Boy, was I wrong. It's a terrific place. Of course, the highlight was eating, by far and away, the most delicious ribs in the world. We arrived too late to see the museums, which included a surprisingly broad variety of interesting topics, from jazz music to Negro baseball leagues. But we did catch a baseball game in a gorgeous, fountain-filled stadium. Yes, the local team is the worst in its division, but what it won this game in historic fashion with a walk-off, extra-inning, grand slam home run. If you know anything about baseball, you know that's something special. History is everywhere you go. Two presidential libraries were on our map, Harry Truman's in Independence, Missouri, and Dwight Eisenhower's in Abilene, Kansas, plus the birthplace of Mark Twain and Jesse James, and just crossing the Great Mississippi River. These and so much more were reminders of how much of our history was made out here, not just back there in the East where I was born and raised. And then there is the vastness of the great open places of America. Drive across Kansas from one end to the other, and you cannot but be moved by the wonder and majesty of the Great Plains. It is truly something to behold. What a terrific trip. One regret that I waited so long to do it. Behava Nasalu il Nahayat Hadahil Halka Min Baranamaj Dakil Washington. Ida Kenneth Ladekum Ea and Staff Sarat. O ta'ali kat haul hadahil halka, wa chasatan haul el elaka, bain el sulta el tanfidia, wal sulta el kedaia, fi America, arjuan tatawasilumai, aber Twitter, a la hashtag inside Washington, o antarasaludimubasharatan, a la at Rob Satloff. 
Sharakum will spoil Mukbil, while Illa on El Kakum, Shukran Lakum, while Illa Laka.